Bisha Owamua. Good morning. My name is Lynn Manning John. I am the vice principal of Owyhee Combined School. I'm also a tribal member here um, of the Duck Valley Shoshone Paiute Tribe. I'd like to welcome you all here today um, to our home and our homelands. And to get us started, I'd like to introduce my mother, Yolanda Manning, who is going to give us our blessing today. If I can have everyone please stand for the opening prayer. Thank you. Yes, Nina and Megabat. Yara me no, you know, she won't. Ikea yaman. The Denich Weber. No, Kosho Himayan on Ikati Piari Pogobat. The new money penina. The Natinich Weber. Ike unico nanano hima bijau rohani tabana oi unies muruaki muruoti tor Ike unico hima shopijakwaran ya me kai newepana ya unico ni shopijakwaran ni manik pun ti quizo ain how nikroe ti natini chwepe ni new alpigana no kosho ya no nike ti piari puguva Ma was a kebuhava, he be no cows of Mayana. He be some money penico. Need the rum, manatini chaper, Mirini chay the rosso also. It can only call him as a Mayana. Nibonina Toy can also him as a honey tabana. The quizzo I can only con the major coin of an all. Ya nina not to rum, no cosit. The Natini Chuip Mumuat, a punico him money than it was. Yes, she's a conome only, only go he can. Never were no, Nijo Pijaquatuk, Nijo was like a honey cry. We shall some oito him as a honey. Oh, no, some he never money, pisha manic, penicoya, roco bari, white yana. Get a peri, presumayan, ya no, cotinana, no, he no, cosia. Ya Tinare Capano, Cosohima Unico, Ucara Mihikara, Vijao Uatabaico, Vijao Hima Ruhani Tabana, no nods, honors a me, Vijano Mani Ponicoyan on a TPRI Pagova, O Chesimas, O Poa Poa. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> and uh, to continue the presentation today, um, I'd like to welcome Brian. I'll take it. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. And this is for you. Oh, thank you very much. Of course. Of course. Thank you. Um, good morning, all of you. My name is Danica Hayes, and I serve as dean at UNLV's College of Education. And we are grateful to be in community in Owyhee on the Duck Valley Reservation, so thank you for having us. I have the distinct privilege of introducing our speaker this morning, Dr. Brian McKinley Jones Brayboy of the Lumbee Tribe. Dr. Brayboy serves as Dean and Carlos Montezuma Professor of Education and Social Policy at Northwestern. And he has an extensive vita that we will not go through <laughs> right now for you, but some key things that are important for our conversation today. He is an international scholar, if not the international scholar in tribal cred. And he will, I'm sure, give you a lot more information about what tribal cred is. But what it means to me is being able to center and celebrate indigenous voices particularly in education and where education intersects with other parts of society. He has uh, also done incredible work in educational spaces all the way from early childhood education to higher education to essentially deconstruct and reconstruct knowledge around what education means and what it should mean in center community. And so it is befitting to have him here on the reservation with us today and for you to have this opportunity to hear from him. So without further ado, Dr. Brayboy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Danica. Um, good morning, afternoon almost. Um, 
thank you so much for welcoming us in a good way. I'm grateful for it. My name is Brian McKinley Jones Brayboy, and I am the son of Mary Elizabeth Jones Brayboy. She was the daughter of uh, Zelma Sampson Jones um, and Rose Bell McMillan Jones. Um, she's also the daughter of McKinley Jones Sr. I'm also the son of Bobby Dean Brayboy, who's the son of Eva Harris Brayboy and Tecumseh Brian Brayboy II. Some people will say to me, like, what's with all of the names? Um, I'm named after my grandfathers, um, McKinley Jones Sr. and, and uh, Tecumseh Brian Brayboy II. So um, my parents had this deal. If they had boys, my dad would name them. If they had girls, my mom would name them. And, and much to my mother's chagrin, they had three boys. Um, <laughs> So I come from this small community in North Carolina called Prospect. Um, that's me as a, I, I don't know, I'm either in second or third grade. Um, there my mom made that shirt um, for me. We did not have a, a, a lot of resources, um, material resources growing up, but we had um, a pretty fantastic family and a great network in our community. I will call to your attention and that sign in the lower corner, it says, um, Welcome to Prospect Community Cradle of Indian Prosperity, established 1879. Um, I'm going to say something about this establishment of 1879 for a group of people who emerged from a river many, many years before, before that. But it's, it's important to know that um, there's something about the way in which we talk about ourselves that will become pretty important for what they're doing. That's my mom with our oldest son, um, Quana. I'm the father of Quana McKinley Warner Brayboy and, and uh, Ely Tecumseh Warner Brayboy. And there with my dad on the right, um, my mom on the, on the left. And here they are um, together. Uh, the older son, Quana, is a, um, a senior at. Um, Yale, where he plays soccer, and, um, and his younger brother, Ely, is a um, second year student at Brown studying computer science. And frankly, like for me, they are, for us, they are, are everything. Um, and the work that we're doing is fundamentally about our children, your children, and, um, and mine. So I think it's important just to give you a sense about, about who I am. Just put myself on the clock so I don't go too far. So here's the thing, I, I'm really interested. I, I know that for, there's a group of, of you all who are joining who are teachers. Some of you all are pre-service teachers. Um, had a really great conversation with Kenny and Nicole. Um, and I really wanna thank UNLV and the state of Nevada for, um, and all of your partners for having me. And I certainly recognize the fact that I'm a visitor, visitor here um, but I've been thinking a lot about like how might we either imagine or reimagine our classrooms if we think about it through a um, through a, a lens of knowledge systems. And I'm gonna try to tuck in at the end if I have time to talk about indigenous knowledge systems because I think it's an actually actually a really important way for us to get at some very core and basic assumptions about what our classrooms and what our lives might begin to to look like. So, but I need to start talking with you all about American Indian education first because we can't actually talk about indigenous knowledge systems or indigenous peoples without understanding um, who we are. Native schooling, indigenous schooling, and the federal government are intimately tied to one another. Um, Danica mentioned tribal crit. One of the points I make in that, um, in that theory is really that these are so deeply intertwined and for us to not do that is a mistake. But it's also important to think about the fact that native peoples are mentioned in the Constitution three times. Um, one of which um, the clause references the fact that natives shouldn't be taxed, which in lots of ways, the way people think about this is a fundamental recognition of, of nationhood from the start. It is part of fundamental part of the way that this country has, um, has been formed, although it's been forgotten. And we're gonna talk a bit about temporal issues and memory issues as well. But I also think this is important because many, many times we think about native peoples as racialized beings 
we are political beings. Our relationship with the federal government and with the state government puts us in a different sort of political class. It doesn't mean we are unaffected by racism. It doesn't mean we are not racialized peoples in larger things. So part of the argument here for me is we inhabit this liminal space as both racialized beings and political and legal ones, which will become really important. And I'm gonna talk about how that, how that shows up. Um, so I wanna just talk about this, this last bullet here. Um, over the course of, of the U.S. being formed, um, there were roughly a billion acres of land that were either ceded or not ceded um, to, be able to, make that, to be able to make that happen. If you think about the history of the U.S., it is about land, it is about place, it is about property, it is about ownership, and things that come out of that. And I'll say more about that um, momentarily. So I'm gonna, I want to talk to you about the four T's, tribal sovereignty, uh, treaties, trust, and territory. Tribal sovereignty is really the inherent right of indigenous peoples to be able to create and make futures of their, of their own making. I, I want to get really clear about this. It's the inherent right. And while I'm going to talk about treaties and I'm going to talk about the political peace and I'm going to talk about the Constitution, this is a right that we are born with. It is inherent. It shouldn't be canceled by anything that nine people sitting on a court in Washington, D.C. have to say or 435 people in Washington, D.C. have to say. So let's get really clear about that. It's that inherent right. The way it gets enacted, including thinking about where we are in this unbelievable community and this fantastic school, is really the operationalization of that becomes self-determination. So for us to be self-determining, you have to have incredible members of the community who are leading the school. That's all about the work that we're talking about um, today. Treaties. So the first T is tribal sovereignty. The second T is, is treaties. These are really agreements between equals in the US. They are ratified by, by Congress. There are 371 treaties. I think it's important to note that the Constitution references um, the uh, treaties as being the supreme law of the land. Okay. So it's there. It exists. The question is, why don't people know about, know about this? I want to ask some forgiveness from tribal members here because I'm going to talk about their treaty. Uh, and I didn't ask permission, which is um, potentially problematic, but I do it in a real sense of, of humility and a, and a deep request that... Um, that I do it, but I think it's important for the points I want to make here, which is we have to pay attention to place and we have to pay attention to time. So spatial and temporal issues for the work that we do in our classrooms and in our schools and in our districts and in thinking about the schooling of our children, whether they are indigenous or not, becomes really important. But I'm really interested in indigenous children. So this is a year and 30 days before the state of Nevada be um, becomes a state. Um, it, this is a, a treaty of peace and friendship. And I, 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 there's something really important here. So U.S. shows up, people show up, they want to build a railroad, they want to mine stuff, and the Shoshone people are like, these are our lands. No. There was no permission being asked in this, and so there were skirmishes. And so Shoshone people are saying, we're not going to do this. Um, and so the federal government comes in and says, we need, a friend, we need a treaty around friendship and peace so that we can do these things. And so they convinced, um, and it, it ends up being a really interesting thing. They talk to Shoshone people who then say, okay, like, you can do this. I want to get really clear because Shoni people make a really compelling argument um, and it's backed up by evidence that they did not cede the lands. Okay. There was an agreement for lands to be used in particular ways, but the lands were not given to the federal government. It's worth digging into this to look at the lawsuits and the way in which these um, um, really strong leaders in the community where we are said, 
y'all got to fix this. Here's some really important language in, in this when we think about the historical pieces, at least for me. So the, the United States, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read, this is all quoted from the treaty. Being aware of the inconvenience resulting to the Indians in consequence of the driving away and destruction of game along the routes traveled by white men. And then they go on to say, the United States promised and agreed to pay the said bands of the Shoshone Nation parties here too, annually for the term of 20 years, the sum of $5,000 in such articles, including cattle for herding or other purposes. And then at the bottom of this paragraph, they say full compensation and equivalent for the loss of game and the rights of privilege. There's nothing there about land. Okay. How many payments did the federal government make of those promised 20? This many. This many. So if we're going to think about treaties, if we're going to think about the four T's, if we're going to think about indigenous issues, if we're going to think about what it means to educate people, and these, there are promises that have become the supreme law of the land, and one of the partners fails to up, hold their end of the bargain, it creates a, a particular set of challenges, right? History matters, and place matters. And it should matter for us wherever we are. And when I say place here, I'm talking about land that has been imbued with meaning by people. And all you have to do is make the drive, as we did this morning, luckily, from Elko here, and understand that this place is magnificent. Third T is trust. And this really comes from um, the pre previous two T's, right? This is, this is the, it's a fundamental recognition of the relationship between the federal government and tribal nations. It's connected to these agreements. Um, but it's also connected to land, which often show up as territory, the fourth T. Um, we are on territory as we speak, right? At the request and in partnership with the, with the guardians um, of this place. So tribal sovereignty, treaties, trust, and territory become a really important part of understanding um, these conversations. Tied to that, if you think about the history of, of American Indian education, and more specifically here, I mean the history of American Indian schooling. Okay. 1819, Congress passes this law called the Civilization Fund. Think about what that means and all of what it entails to name it Civilization Fund. They later used this as a way to have boarding schools start in 1879, where they pulled our children out of our homelands and away from our families and sent them to school with the idea of killing the Indian in him and saving the man. So, y'all, there's lots of us that have really fraught relationships with schooling. And um, it's not an accident that we have a fraught relationship with it. It is intended to assimil um, assimilate us, to civilize us, Schooling is a place that ripped our children from us. And if you think about the importance of children, and I think we all do who are doing schooling and education, like that's not just our present, it's our future. And so what you do with schooling is actually wreck people's and communities and nations, futures, by pulling their children from them and saying, what you're doing isn't good enough. Hopefully I'll be able to try to pull some of these things together. So I should say, right, I've just given you all not a great intro. It's a bit depressing when you think about it. At the same time, um, I've worked with teams that have prepared native teachers for the last 20 years, um, almost 200 of them. Almost all of them are still working in in schools. Three of them are now superintendents, lots of principals and vice principals. I actually have a really firm belief that if we do schooling right, it can be used as a way to help drive success and drive opportunity. But the key piece is, is what might it, might it look like? And so some will argue for us, like, w w what are we supposed to be doing? Well, some of it's about preparing children for the workforce. Okay. Fair enough. 
That's happening in Nevada. You all have a few workforce things happening. Others will say it's to prepare children for the world in which they're going to live. Both of these things can in fact be true. The question is what, what world will our children begin to live in if we're thinking about this and for places um, in Nevada with changing climate, with fights over water increasingly, with battles over air, with access to food, there's some uncertainty about what our children's futures might actually look like and how do we project into the future for what that is. So there's some, probably some stuff we need to start with now. What do we learn in school? Right? These are just a few of those things we learn. We learn how to socialize or to be friends or not. There are these beautiful signs out, outside of this um, room that we're in that, that says we don't do bullying. So there's already some aspects of that. It's where we teach people potentially to be good citizens, whatever that is. We teach people how to categorize and how to sort, how to be individuals. I don't know what it was like for you all at schools, but for us it was like, okay, boys on this side, girls on this side, shortest in the front, tallest in the back. Johnny, keep your hands to yourself. Brian, stop doing that. It helps us become good citizens in that way too, with some set of expectations about what kinds of behaviors we might do. But schools teach us how to sort. And, and for me, I'm going to ask a question like, why and to what end? Why, do we, why is it that we do that? This second to last bullet point for me is really important. It's about a zero sum way of thinking about this. And I want to encourage us to think about schooling as a place of abundance rather than scarcity. In order for someone to be in the 99th percentile, someone needs to be in the first percentile. Think about that. For there to be winners, there has to be losers. Like that is, that is fundamentally a framing of scarcity. And if we reimagine schooling and we reimagine our classroom to move to a place of abundance, then everyone wins. Like why is it? And a question for me to you all and to you all who are watching, like why do we do that? Is that an inherent thing that there are winners and losers? Look at nature. Sometimes that's the case, but, but lots of things thrive by working together. And, and it's possible to create the conditions so that all kinds of things are thriving. Why not do that in schools? I mean, part of it is I don't want to bury the lead is because human beings are involved. And we've bought into this system about hierarchies and this zero sum mentality. I don't think that has to be the case. So I've already skipped into this, right? I, that last bullet for me is really important. How might we think about schools as sites of possibility rather than ones of foreclosure? And when we sort in particular ways, when we group people with particular abilities, we start to foreclose real futures. And the idea that someone at four years old or five years old is you have a sense, anyone has a sense about what they might do in the future is insane. We were just having a conversation, Nicole and I, on the way up, um, and she talked about, um, am I allowed to tell this story about your father? <laughs> he grew up not having access to a bunch of food. He had access to food, and all of a sudden he grew like crazy. Right? What happens when we nourish people? What happens when we nourish people's spirits? They start to thrive. So that's my encouragement for what I really want to talk about today. So let me talk about a little bit about knowledge systems, which in some ways is where I started. Um, and, and this is really how we might think about this, um, this work and the ecologies of our classroom. And I use ecologies very, very intentionally in my work. Um, here because there are these intersecting relationships that become really important that make up the larger ecology of what classrooms might look like. I mean, in some ways I'm gonna talk about imagining, reimagining schools, but I'm really interested in reimagining classrooms because as teachers, 
whether we're pre-service teachers or teachers, there are some administrators here who can do the hard work of reimagining schools, but what might we do with the children in front of us? What might we do with the young adults in, in front of us? And trying to manage a group of 20 or 30 or 35 students on some days feels manageable. And what if a bunch of people did that, working together? What if an entire school thought about each teacher starting to reimagine their classrooms based on the children in front of them? What might it look like? Nature does this all the time, right? Our systems do it all the time. And sometimes what we as humans do is we muck around with it and try to do things and then it's off to the races with not such great stuff. So what is this thing I'm trying to talk about um, here today? For me, knowledge systems are these tools. They are tools for us. And, and there are ways to visualize them, and I'm going to try to give you some sense about what that might look like in terms of our classrooms to get really, really clear about it. But our systems are usually the status quo, and they're often hidden, a lot like air, like the air we breathe. What are we? We're at 5,600 feet right now. It's not as great breathing here as it is in places where it's 2,000 feet or at sea level, right? So air shows up, you can see it when it's harder to breathe. It shows up when the wind blows. It shows up when there is smog in the air. And for any of us who ever lived in, in valleys when there's an inversion, you can see the air, right? And if something comes along and blows it out, a storm, and, and then you've got something there. I want us to think about what it means to make the invisible visible. And it's part of my encouragement in us thinking about knowledge systems um, today. So people are like, Kai, you've just been talking about this thing and you still haven't defined it for us. But actually I have been talking about them. I've been talking around them. I've been trying to talk through them. The way that we started this meeting is a demonstration of a knowledge system to have someone welcome us to this place in a really good way. For those of you all who aren't here, there's an abundance of food and drink. There are young people moving around, handling their business and doing their thing in a way that clearly someone has cared for them. Many peoples have cared for them. The systems are there if we start to pay attention to them. What I haven't done, and this is what schooling will often ask us to do, is, well, what's the answer? What are the component parts of it? How do I know? How do I assess? How do I measure? How do I give a grade on this as an assignment? When you're not being really direct and explicit, how do I build a rubric for this? Right. For many of us who are indigenous peoples, the rubric was, were you able to survive and live? That's a pretty good rubric of success. Can you hunt? Can you fish? Can you be nice to your neighbors? Can you show up in good ways? Can you not pollute the water around you? Can you behave in a way that is collective rather than fundamentally orienting yourself? What is the first thing after the alphabet that children learn how to write? Their names. And then you get punished if your name isn't on your test. I'm sorry, you get no credit for the work you've done. You didn't put your name on there. And so we become really attached to our names. I'm attached to my name too because of what it means for me genealogically, but schools have an emphasis on names in a very different sort of way. It is the formation of an individual. And part of what the great work that Kenny and Nicole and the UNLV School of Education is doing here is really helping us think about what might a collective sense of our work look like. How great that we're here 
I got off of a plane in Salt Lake yesterday. I drove three hours to Elko. We drove two hours here. What a blessing, right? Why would I ask y'all to come to Salt Lake? Because it's convenient for me. Like, how dumb, right? If we're thinking about this collectively and relationally, the terms of the debate change. It's part of the point I want to make. Okay, so finally, I'm going to get there. <laughs> People are like, oh my God, the students who are online are like, seriously, dude, my grade depends on this. <laughs> I got stuff to do. I got to get the professional development stuff. What's the answer? The call for that, the call for the answer, tells us a whole bunch about the systems that we work in. So I want to talk to you about these five component parts of, of this. Um, and in lots of ways, they're philosophical sorts of, of conversations, although we can imagine them in, in other ways. And I'll, I'll get back to indigenous knowledge systems um, at the end of this. And so, um, Piston, I, I've sort of constructed this. There are lots of people talking about this now. This is the way I think about indigenous knowledge systems. It's not the end answer, just to be clear. Right? There are people who will argue with me and quibble with me. If there are philosophers in the room, you're going to get mad at me in a moment. Or if there are philosophers watching, you're going to get mad at me in a moment because we're like, that's not how we define epistemology. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's fair. Um, but it's how I'm going to define it. Um, today. So this first framing, and in some ways this is a, the, the real orienting piece about what schools do, is really how we think about knowing. How do we know? So these are the questions we ask, right? How do we come to know what we know? And what is knowledge? And so for lots of us, we'll say what resides in our brain. That's where we put it. Sometimes it's on paper. Sometimes it's on the internet, but it's also in nature and in place. Think about all of the things that you learn from just walking around through space and place and all of the knowledge that it's held there. For some of us, our lessons are really about, well, this thing happened in this place. We do it too. Like, what happened at Gettysburg? That's knowledge, and it's tied to a particular place. There's other stuff in there, right? But it's not just the facts about what happens at Gettysburg or what happens in Philadelphia with the Constitutional Convention or, or whatever it is. The air pollution doesn't just happen in a lab. It happens everywhere. Clean water is not a thing for us to just study in a lab. We carry it with us in our bodies. Okay. And so part of what I, I want to suggest to you that, that knowledge and the ways we think about what it means to know is that it's ubiquitous. It is everywhere. Like knowledge is always around us. What schools teach us to do is to compartmentalize knowledge. Right? I just want to know about what's on this. I don't want to know about that other stuff. I need to assess you on this stuff. Okay. But what about these other things? What about what young children bring with them to, to school? How might we begin to center and think about that? How do we think about our ways of being? We might ask, what does it mean to be? Or what is my reality? So... The reality of being two hours from the nearest big city with a big grocery store is different than the reality of being five minutes from that place in a whole bunch of ways, right? The reality of having a single parent at home versus two, the reality of having a set of parents and aunties and uncles and grandparents all of those things end up mattering. But the thing about our realities is they shift and they migrate and they move. They change over time. This is the, the, for all of these, there are these temporal and spatial components that I want to just continue to come, come back to. 
that's ubiquitous and it's really tied to our knowledge and so when we start to sort things in school and we sort based on knowledge and we don't think about being in reality we've pulled apart two things that, that fundamentally go together lots of people think about pedagogy as well it's just how I think about teaching it's my teaching but it's not Pedagogy is about how we think about both teaching and learning. And so for those of you all who want to be teachers or who are teachers, how do you think about learning? It fundamentally shifts what you teach and how you teach it if your young people need to know very specific things. Right? I suppose you can learn how to fish or how to camp by reading a book but often it, it helps if you just do it. And then you make some mistakes. Hopefully they're not really bad mistakes, but you make some mistakes. But stories teach us, right? Think about how often you have something that's a story that you use as a way to teach someone some lesson or something you want them to know. Like knowledge and like way of our ways of being pedagogy and teaching and learning are verbs okay so i want to disrupt this notion that knowledge is a noun and that our realities are a noun right we might look at them and say here's all the knowledge i need it's right here in this thing okay Other than Google, YouTube is the next largest used search engine for how people learn how to do things. What it does is it tells you how to do it, it doesn't do it for you. And so there's a really powerful interconnection between those medium and media that we, we use. And again, teaching and learning are really tied to how we think about being and, and, and how we think about knowledge. And for me, there is so much beauty in that and the possibilities of it. And speaking of beauty, I want to talk to you about axiology, which is often philosophers think about this as the aesthetic, right? What's beautiful? They argue over this. There's some sense that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. That's a philosophical, that's an axiological argument. In some ways it's an ontological argument too. That's my 30 minute warning. And my 15 minute clock is on. So let's see if I can actually do this. I tend to think about these as exploring what's good, true, right, and beautiful. It's our values. So when I said, like, I, I had been talking about knowledge systems and people are like, you, are you gonna tell us what they are or not? That tells us a bunch about our values, about how we think about knowledge, right? Boys on this side, girls on this side. Shortest in the front, tallest to the back. We value being able to order things. Our classrooms, our schools want order in things in a very particular kind of order. Why do we need the, the shortest in the front and the tallest in the back? Why do we need girls on one side and boys on the other? Like, why? What if we just sort of shifted that around? Haudenosaunee or Iroquois Confederacy peoples when, um, um, who were in, in, in Canada, what's now Canada and the U.S., um, were unbelievable and still are unbelievable farmers. And um, when the French and English showed up, they noticed that they had um, corn, beans, and squash all growing together. It's often called the Three Sisters. Um, and so they burned the, the fields. And they suggested that they need to have corn in a row and beans here and squash here. Um, because that was the order of things and that's how you could be efficient. Well, what the Haudenosaunee knew over a long period of time is that there's a corn stalk. The valleys are windy. The corn goes like this. Beans need something to grow on. It would grow around the corn and provide it with some stability. And squash on the ground would both keep moisture in the ground but also put nitrates into the ground that made the whole relationship, the whole ecology, 
work. And someone came in and said, we need to be efficient. We want all the corn here, boys on this side. We want all the beans here, girls on this side. We want all the squash here, tallest in the front, tallest in the back, shortest in the front. Sometimes there's a reason for things to happen if we stop and we pay attention. And so my encouragement um, for us is to think about what the ecologies in our classroom are. How are we creating those ecologies? How might we disrupt them? How might we reimagine new sets of ecologies in our classrooms or in our leadership communities or in our schools? Like what might we do to kind of say, maybe this isn't working? Values get lived. And for me, like this undergirds all of our knowledge systems. We value particular kinds of knowledge. We value particular ways of being. Remember I said, Johnny, keep your hands to yourself and Brian, stop doing that. Early on, it's the boys, right? Developmentally, boys are, have a really hard time doing that stuff. Like, okay, yeah, they shouldn't be hitting each other. Yes, that can be disruptive and a problem. It, it also happens to be what their brains are doing. Like, it's developmentally appropriate to do some of this stuff. What would happen if we stopped trying to control things in, that, that don't necessarily need to be controlled in particular ways? What might it say about our values? So if Johnny needs to be reminded to stop hitting people, okay. But what does that mean in terms of Johnny's opportunities? Because he's hard to manage in terms of then foreclosing his future. I was Johnny, by the way. And if my mother didn't show up to school and fight like a wildcat on my behalf and say, you will not put my child in that special education group because I know what happens to them because y'all don't know how to differ do differentiated learning, who knows? I'm not a model of success, just to be clear. I don't think about myself that way. But what kind of future might I have if my mom didn't say, you will not do that because he's being disruptive? I mean, she had another brother who was really bad to sort of go by to see that I, me as the middle child was okay <laughs> and wait until they got to the younger one. Holy smokes. But by then she had the school trained and the schools trained to make really clear that's what's happening. What if children don't have Mary Bray Boy? What if you check your values and ask questions like, I wonder why? I wonder what if? And then the, the fifth component for me of knowledge systems is really cosmology. This is fundamentally comes from astrophysics who think about cosmology is really how do we imagine um, the creation of the universe. So we might ask what's the origin or what's the beginning. I showed you that sign. Welcome to Prospect, Cradle of Indian Prosperity, established in 1867. Are you kidding me? Really? So that's the beginning, but it's not the origin. I assume Shoshone peoples have an origin story that starts before whenever this reservation gets started in 1862 or three. What about your place where you work or where you teach? What is the origin story of that place? Right? What happened beforehand? Think about all the cool assignments you can do by asking folks, like, how did we get to this school? What was here before? I had a recent disagreement with someone who's a big proponent of um, land-grant institutions. On July 2nd, 1862, Congress signs into, or President signs into law the, the Morrill Act that sets up colleges and universities and gives land to institutions. So land-grant institutions have them. And I said, well, where did the land come from? And they said, the government. And I said, where did the government get its land? Oh, it just had it. It just had it. 
what is the origin of the land? What is the origin of it? And, and what happens when people think of it as a place rather than as a commodity? What do we do with that? And what kinds of cool things might we do if we ask those questions? What are the origins of the curriculum or the curricula that we teach? What are the origins of the order of things? What are the origins of us saying, well, by age three, children need to be doing X, Y, and Z? Well, there's some science to that, but there's a whole bunch of range and variation about what actually happens and what works and in different places. I once had a colleague, a dear friend of mine, who had a, a native student in the reading class. And this colleague, who's lovely, came to me and said, I think I'm going to have to fail this student. And I said, why? And they said, well, in order to teach reading, you have to be able to make these 26 sounds. And the student there are three of them that this student can't make. The student's first language was their native language. There were sounds that what the student would say to me later is, there are sounds my tongue can't make. And so I asked my colleague, so grateful, she said to me, I think this is gonna have to happen. And I said, how do you suppose the student learned how to read? Because they were taught by people from their tribe who also can't make that. Are they a good reader? Exceptional, my colleague says. Critical, thoughtful, the papers are great. But they can't make the sound. I can't pass them. And I said, well, who created the rubric? And they said, well, it's science. And I said, well, what do you mean? They're like these large, randomized, controlled things that we've done, these RCTs and RCMs and whatever it is y'all reading people do. <laughs> and there's evidence. And I said, well, there's evidence in front of you. What will you do with it? And how can I help you make this decision? Failing the class would have meant being kicked out of the program. It was a teacher training program. Um, and so I asked her, like, what's the beginning of this? Where's the start of it? And what might the end be in this? And I will say to you that 17 years after this person graduated with their degree, because my colleague said, I'm going to make an exception, and she is that, sorry, that person has continued to make exceptions. That student was named Teacher of the Year in their state. Outstanding teacher of the entire state. When I say to you, what does it mean to, not for, to think about this as possibilities and not foreclose futures? That's what I mean. It's a singular student who over the time that they won the award, like the reading scores, by the way, this is so funny, the reading scores of this student went through the roof when they became the, the and that student gives the professor all the credit. The student has no idea this conversation happened behind closed doors, just to be clear. How many children did that teacher impact and how many futures did they open by saying, we're going to do that and have this colleague of mine say, I want to reimagine the beginning and sort of start anew. Like, what would it mean for us to do that? All I did was ask a question. I asked a bunch of them, actually. And I was a little aggressive because this person was my friend and because this human being who is still teaching is so remarkable. So, there are temporal aspects of this and genealogical aspects of it. And we might ask ourselves, some of you are from the State Department of Nevada. I hope you don't, if, if you hate this, I hope you don't go back to UNLV and say, why did you bring that guy here? <laughs> He's horrible. Okay. What might it mean for us to rethink the way we imagine schooling and the process of schooling? So, here are the questions together just to kind of... Um, 
I'm at 43 minutes. Do you think I can go a little bit longer? Okay. Um, see, you see what I'm doing, right? I, I'm putting myself on a clock. And for those of us who are from tribal communities, when we have meetings and community gatherings, they start when they start. Almost always after when we say they're going to start. And they end when they end. There is no end time. Maybe it's different here. It's not, is it? <laughs> they end when they end, man. When we're done, we're done. Because we got to get to the stuff. Heaven forbid if tribal council goes into executive session and there's still stuff to do, right? So, and it would drive, like, that drives people crazy who aren't from that, that place because they're like, why can't y'all just have a two-hour meeting? Here are the questions together. So I just put myself on the clock. Here I am bending to all of that. And I'm going to keep bending to it because I love Kenny and Nicole. Um, and I love UNLV. Um, how do we come to know? How do we be? How do we think about the process of teaching and learning? What are our values? And what's the beginning? What's the origin of this? Think about what happens for you in your classrooms or your future classrooms if you begin to create this rubric on your own. And you ask yourself honestly, like, how do, what do I think about knowledge? Is it a noun or is it a verb or is it both? How do I think about people's realities? Do I care about them? Like imagine a government that says about children, eh, their parents should work harder. We're not gonna feed them. We're gonna decline having people send us food to help feed our children. What does that say about values? But what does it say about their realities and what it means to be? Like, have y'all ever been hungry and tried to learn something? You ever been hungry and tried to be like in relation with some other people? The Snickers commercial that says feeling hangry is so effective because it resonates so well with people who are like, you know what, I, 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 with our loved ones, I'm really sorry, I was just hungry. And so we ask children to come to school hungry and then ask them to learn and then say, it's their parents' fault? Like, what are our values of, of that? And if school has this origin of, of kind of getting people in line, are there new ways for us to imagine creating new possibilities for, for students? Which, by the way, creates all kinds of new possibilities for our society. It's not just for the children. I mean, that's what it should be about. But it's for all of us. Right? This is why I, I go a little bit crazy thinking about the rabid focus on individuals rather than on the collective whole, about what those individuals contribute to why I'm so bothered by the fact that we have such a strong emphasis on rights and not also on the concomitant responsibilities. Being a citizen isn't just about having rights. It's about having responsibilities too. Right? Why are we so focused on individuals and not the collective? Did the U.S. juridical laws and U.S. code get sent down on... Uh, to us on like like metal plates that said here's what they are were they created out of ether by some entity or deity or did people make them and if people made them then people can change them and so i'm asking you as teachers and administrators and pre-service teachers what might it mean if you changed your the way you do things i don't know the worst thing that can happen is you make a mistake Y'all, mistakes are really good. They are the site of possibility and the site of learning. And we get so worked up when we miss something. Like, where does that come from? We evolve, communities evolve through mistakes. We know to eat particular foods 
because someone ate it once and there was this effect. We know not to eat something because Johnny ate it and died. <laughs> Don't eat that. It killed Johnny. Look at that animal just ate it and it died. Maybe we shouldn't eat it. That's a mistake that then leads to learning. Oh, I was having this eucalyptus the other day. I was chewing on it and the back of my, my, back of my mouth went a little numb. Oh, you have a toothache? You know what? Susie was chewing on eucalyptus. Chew on some and see if it helps. Oh my gosh, how fantastic. This is great. The best scientific labs in the world make mistakes, which leads to greater science. Good science doesn't happen by following a scientific model and just repeating what everybody else did. It doesn't. Like, it just doesn't. Like, there's no, that's a fact. So you verify it, and then you're like, well, let's try some new stuff. I almost cursed there. There are children in the room. Try new things. Make mistakes. It's okay. It'll be okay. Probably some mistakes you shouldn't make, but you know what those are. But tweaking your curriculum and tweaking the way you teach and listening a little bit longer to Susie because she needs it is okay. Not just okay, it's kind of preferable. And I realize there's a whole bunch of other things around that we can't control, and so I'm not discounting those, just to be clear. I'm not. We have some classrooms that we can try to manage some stuff with. Okay, so let me just quickly talk about this, because I want to end, um, and you all can go on about your, about your lives free of me. Um, so I've always been Native my whole life. Uh, it's not new. Um, I was raised by Native parents um, in and out of our community where knowledge resides, but always back there for at least three months a year where Mama Bray Boy would take us for the, to the family farm, which I am still responsible for. Land in our community goes from, um, um, from woman to woman. My mom had three boys, so I have it, and hopefully um, some of our children will have girls and they can have responsibility for our lands. But I am the caretaker for it. Here's what we know over long periods of time about our knowledge systems. So they're comprised of these philosophical components, but well, here's what we know, and, and this is pretty true universally, right? When you talk to native peoples, there's some quibbles, but for general, like when I talk to people in Africa or I talk to people in New Zealand or I talk to people in China, they're like, yeah, it kind of works for us too. They are empirical. Our knowledge is empirical. It comes from long time observation of the world around us. It's often tied to food and to our survival. It's tied to weather and our survival. It's tied to relationships between people and our survival. There's a reason why people will say, well, we don't plant until this time of the year or until this thing happens because there was all this knowledge, this empirical knowledge of taking in data and analyzing it and thinking about it. And so I, I sometimes am a little bit confused when people say, well, native people don't do science very well. STEM's not really their thing. Let's put them in the humanities and the arts. Y'all, like, we're great scientists. We've been doing it forever. Our lab is the place around us. We are engineers. Hohokam peoples built a very elaborate canal system around the valley in Phoenix to get water spread throughout the valley 3,000 years ago by hand. And the current canals there are on top of those old canals. They were unbelievable engineers and scientists. They're sensual. They come through our senses, right? Think about how you know it's raining. You ever been with someone who's like, my knee is aching, rain is coming? 
You ever been with someone who's like, there's rain? Like they sniff and they know that there's rain? Have you ever heard rain before you saw it? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. And they're multi-sensory. So rather than sort of thinking the, that they reside only in books, that knowledge only resides in books, what would it mean if we thought about them through the lens of sensuality? And I'm not talking about like sexual stuff here to be clear, right? I'm talking about the senses. We feel stuff. They're cumulative. Like my grandmother taught me all of this stuff. Her grandmother taught her. Her grandmother taught her. I grew up with my grandmother in the house. Thousands of years old. It's both empirical and cumulative. Think about all the knowledge that's there. And so in the height of COVID, when our old people were dying ahead of time, for all of us, the tragedy of all of that knowledge being taken away is profound. What would it mean if we had old people and young people together? I mean, lots of us in our communities do that all the time. They're incredible teachers. We laugh about everything in the worst and tragic times, in the best and silliest times. We laugh at other people's misfortunes. We had this guy in the community who dad let him take his boat out and he went to fill it up and he filled it up with diesel and it's a gas <laughs> engine and it led to a whole thing. And um, he's now mid fifties and he still goes by the name of Diesel. <laughs> <laughs> our nicknames are often tied to our misfortune, right? We laugh about stuff, y'all. Like, it's important to be able to laugh and, and, and have fun. Poor Diesel. <laughs> it's located in place. What would it mean for us to think about place as a pedagogical partner? And I don't mean just take the curriculum and content you have and go outside and teach outside on benches. What would it mean for us to listen and learn from place? Well, Native peoples do that all the time. In fact, I'm getting a few head nods from folks in the corner. I'm like, yes. And they're lived and embodied. And when I say it's a verb, we live our knowledges. Any of us who have scars, right, whether they're physical scars or emotional scars, like that's lived knowledge. We embody what we know. And what happens when we set up classrooms where we disrespect those bodies or the embodiment of the, of the knowledge? What happens when we open up to the possibilities of, of that? So they're verbs. Here's the last thing I'd say about this. And for me, in some ways, the most important thing, because I started with ecologies, I want to end with ecologies in some ways. Relationships are everything. Relationships between peoples and place. Relationships between peoples. Relationships between our students and the curriculum. Relationships between us and our students. And here's why they're important, because in many, many, many of our communities, if I am in relation with you, I am then necessarily responsible to and for you. I'm, I, I'm supposed to care for you. So. I will always be responsible to and for Danica from, from here on out. You know, our group got to have dinner last night. Kenny called, and I'm like, yeah, I'll come, of course. <laughs> Kenny said, we're going to do it here. I'm like, okay. That's pretty true, right? I didn't say I, I want everyone to come to me in Salt Lake. <laughs> I mean, Salt Lake's not even in Nevada, so that'd be fun. <laughs> but, okay. Um, and if we are in relation to one another and responsible to one another, then there is a level of reciprocity where we realize that another person's thriving means that I also thrive. Zero-sum games and zero-sum mentalities don't allow that to happen because Danica's success takes away from mine. Like, how silly is that? Why would I not want my friend to be successful. 
Why would I not be happy for her? Well, in part because I think somehow her success is going to get at me. But if we're in relationship and I'm responsible for her and we have some sort of re re reciprocal peace happening, how fantastic. Because then it's great for me too. If we are in relationship with land and we are responsible to land and we care for it and it cares for us back, that's reciprocal. Sometimes the land kills us, but more often it feeds us, it nourishes us, it teaches us. And what do we do? We dig into it. We throw trash on it. We disrespect it. We paint it. We paint our rocks. Like, are you kidding me? You're painting rocks with spray paint? Why are you doing that? Yeah. So let us move toward building relationships. Let us honor the responsibilities that come from that and let us thrive through the reciprocal agreements that kind of emerge from it. So for the students, pre-service teachers who are watching, I'm wishing you all the very best as you move into this. You're in an incredible program and for those of you all who have sat with me and let me talk at you for an hour, thank you very much. And thanks again for allowing us to be in your community. Thank you. Thank you.